Epistemology will demonstrate that we cannot know, cannot be certain of the future, but we don't believe it. We anticipate, and so we're always wrong. Even when what we anticipate comes to pass, we get the wrong idea of our powers and of what our safety depends upon. For we imagine that we knew this would happen and take it either as an occasion for congratulations or for punishments of ourselves or of others, instead of acting as we can and remaining equal to the consequences. Here one might consider the implication of the fact that you say, I knew it, with sharp relief or sudden anguish, and that, of course, it does not mean that in the fact you were fully apprised of a particular outcome. It means, roughly, that something told you, something you wish you'd hearkened to, and while that's no doubt true, the frame of mind in which you express it by saying that in that particular way that you knew assures that you will not hearken, because it reveals a frame of mind in which you have tried and are going on trying now to alchemize a guess or a hope or a suspicion into a certainty, a pry into the future, rather than an intimation of conscience. And Nietzsche thought the metaphysical consolation of tragedy was lost when Socrates set knowing as the crown of human activity. And it is a little alarming from within the conviction that the medium of drama which Shakespeare perfected also ended with him. To think again that Bacon and Galileo and Descartes were contemporary with those events. We will hardly say that it was because of the development of the new science and the establishing of epistemology as the monitor of philosophical inquiry that Shakespeare's mode of tragedy disappeared. But it may be that the loss of presentness, which is what the disappearance of that mode of tragedy means, is what works us into the idea that we can save our lives by knowing them. This seems to be the message both of the new epistemology and of Shakespeare's tragedy themselves. In the unbroken tradition of epistemology since Descartes and Locke, radically questioned from within itself only in our period, the concept of knowledge of the world disengages from its connections with matters of information and skill and learning and becomes fixed to the concept of certainty alone, and in particular to a certainty provided by the, by my, senses. At some early point in epistemological investigations, the world normally present to us, the world in whose existence, as it's typically put, we believe, is brought into question and vanishes, whereupon all connection with the world is found to hang upon what can be said to be present to the senses. And that turns out, shockingly, not to be the world. It is at this point that the doubter finds himself cast into skepticism turning the existence of the external world into a problem. Kant called it a scandal to philosophy and committed his genius to putting a stop to it. But it remains active in the conflicts between traditional philosophers and their ordinary language critics, and it inhabits the void of comprehension between continental ontology and Anglo-American analysis as a whole. Its relevance to us at the moment is only this, the skeptic does not gleefully and mindlessly forego the world we share, or thought we shared. He is neither the knave Austin took him to be, nor the fool the pragmatists took him for, nor the simpleton he seems to men of culture and of the world. He foregoes the world for just the reason that the world is important, that it is the scene and stage of connection with the present. He finds that it vanishes exactly with the effort to make it present. If this makes him unsuccessful, that is because the presentness achieved by certainty of the senses cannot compensate for the presentness which had been elaborated through our old absorption in the world. But the wish for genuine connection is there. And there was a time when the effort, however hysterical, to assure epistemological presence was the best expression of seriousness about our relation to the world. The, the expression of an awareness that presentness was threatened, gone. If epistemology wished to make knowing a substitute for that fact, that is scarcely a foolish or knavish and scarcely some simple mistake. It is, in fact, one way to describe the tragedy King Lear records.